Hello and welcome to The Big Picture here on RCTV. On The Big Picture, we talk about sports. My name is Kevin Vent, and I am the host of The Big Picture. And I am excited because when this show started about four years ago, uh, the genesis of this show was me and my brothers sitting in the basement talking sports. And here we have today, the first time ever on TV, the Vent brothers on The Big Picture. So we're starting off here. Over here, I have Joel Vent. What's going on, fellows? <laughs> I have the big E Vent, Eric Vent. Welcome. Recently, what, EDS or something like that? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> just, just I'm got his degree. Very special. Very special. And then here I have Jonathan Vent. Good evening. All right. And Jonathan Vent has been here many, many times. Fantastic. Okay. So it's great to have everybody here, and it's great to uh, talk about sports in the big picture. And we have been following the Boston Celtics as uh, brothers for quite a number of years, uh, me going back into the late 70s and you, know, you guys later. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, the Boston Celtics are in their, are in their off season right now and they're getting ready to uh, decide what they're going to do in terms of preparing for next year. The Boston Celtics went to the playoffs this year. They got to the first round and got crushed in the first round, probably because they, uh, they didn't really uh, play the sportsmanship game there a little bit. You could argue that they should have lost that last game of the season in the big comeback, um, so they would have drawn a better uh, draft or better playoff p position. But anyway, regardless of that, we're going to start with Joel. Joel, the Boston Celtics have eight picks in the draft this year, and uh, there are free agents out there. What should they do this offseason? What do they need? That decision is a little bit above my pay grade. But <laughs> unfortunately, I'm on a TV show, and I need to give you an answer. Um, this team is definitely in a transition phase. Um, um, they ended up with the third pick, and because they're in transition and they're in an Eastern Conference that, um, if you look at the playoff standings this past season, between um, the uh, – numbers three and eight spot. I think there was only four games that separated right. them. Yeah, yeah. So they need to do something if they want to go ahead because if they don't do anything, they have a potential of missing the playoffs entirely. Right. Um, or even worse than missing the playoffs, making the playoffs every year and getting out in the first round and never getting a good draft pick again. <laughs> yeah, that's not fun. They still have Brooklyn, a yes. Brooklyn pick a year next or two year. from now. Next yeah, year. Yeah, next year, I think. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I don't think Brooklyn's going to be any good next year, so we might have another shot at this number one uh, position. Right. By the way, they got the number three pick because of the Brooklyn trade that they, when they traded Garnett and Pierce to Brooklyn. That's where the number Absolutely. three pick came from. Absolutely. So that's why I think, you know, when I look at all the picks that they have, that they need to uh, maybe take a page from their uh, Foxborough brethren, brethren there, <laughs> where Belichick just accumulates picks, picks and picks, and just always seems to have, even right. when they get – find <laughs> taking away picks they still end up with wait, like wait, a hold. bazillion picks fine for what <laughs> we're, not, we're not really sure we'll make, <laughs> if we want to make this a three-hour show <laughs> we could do that um so it might be wise for them you know to still you know see what's available but mm -hmm. also just hold on to some and see if they can trade for other picks in okay. coming years okay so if joel if you had the, you have the number three pick at the boston celtics do you keep that pick do you trade that pick what do you do with it? My opinion changes every hour. Right now, <laughs> on this hour, I say keep the pick. Okay. Um, whenever you trade the pick, you're always risking – I mean, there's two things. You do know what you're getting when you trade a pick. Right. But also, you have the potential of making other teams in your own conference a lot better, too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it kind of you know, hits you harder that way. Which is way. one of the issues I have with one of the biggest ideas of a trade for a pick is that people are saying we should trade that number three pick to the Philadelphia 76ers for Jaleel Okafor. I like Okafor as a player, but this is not even just the same conference. This is our division. Yeah. Do you trade? And then Philadelphia, who already has a number one pick, would have the number one and the number three pick. I don't know if I would do that. Exactly, exactly. Um, with picks, if we're talking about picks, there are a few options, I think, at okay. the third spot. Um, there's that Croatian guy. His name is Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can't go wrong with Dragon. Can't go wrong with Dragon. <laughs> this is why I'm not GM, because I would totally go for a guy because of his name. <laughs> but, no, I mean, he's a true seven-footer, European. Yep. Um, Celtics, Danny Ainge, he really likes Dirk Nowinski, and he's always looking for that new Dirk Nowinski. Um, I think he tried that with Kelly, uh, Kelly Olenek, although he's not European, he's Canadian. But same thing. <laughs> uh, kind of same thing yeah. After a couple of years, you know, Kelly's he looks one, European. He's one of those fake seven footers, though, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> with the shoes on, he's seven feet. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the, he plays like he's six. <laughs> well, Bender, you mentioned the dragon. We'll call him the dragon. Yeah, the he's, dragon. A, he's only 18 years old, True. Uh, but he's already played professionally in, in Europe and in Israel for Israel. a couple of years. And, he's, all, and, and uh, he's from Croatia, but he is 7 1. And apparently, he's a very good three-point shooter so he is kind of Nowitzki like in that, yeah. in that way so right. if if the comparison to Nowitzki is well-founded and people compare for whatever reason Nowitzki to 
Larry Bird. It'd be oh, like let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, but, but honestly, like I, I always didn't like the comparison between Nowitzki and Bird. He, but since, they're white. They have blonde hair. <laughs> <I know. laughs> it's nuts. It's nuts. But the thing is, you know, if if people are comparing him to Nowitzki and Nowitzki equals Bird, that means Bender equals Bird. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're you're saying you if you were to keep the third pick, Joel, you want to you want to take. Bender, the dragon. Um, yeah, he's probably my first choice. Um, there's, I, you know, I always, sometimes I have some dark thoughts about Thon Maker. You know, <laughs> um, Thon Maker. I mean, he's again a kid, right. but I mean, how bad do you have to be to be a seven footer with a thirty three inch vertical for you not to be viable in the NBA at mm-hmm. some point? Mm-hmm. So I mean, yeah, these players are young. They definitely need to be groomed and molded. But, you know, that's what young people are good at doing. Right, mm-hmm. right. Good at being molded. All right, Eric, keep the pick, trade the pick. What do you do? I say to keep the pick. I mean, you have the number three pick. As Joel said, you may not have this be this high ever again mm-hmm. in the next five or six years. So I think you keep the pick. And especially if you're the Celtics. Especially if you're the Celtics. <laughs> Who have never and, had the number one pick, by the way, they, they pointed and, out. Uh, and while, you know, they are a team in transition, they have been showing steady improvement since mm-hmm. the Pierce Garnett heyday. Uh and so I'd like to see that continue. And I think the way you do that is that I don't think they're in the point right now where they need to draft for position. I think they mm-hmm. just need to keep on acquiring talent because even if that talent doesn't end up working in their scheme, that talent can then turn into other big-name talent coming in via trade. And we've seen Danny Ainge be very successful with that in the sure, past. Sure. So I think you go for the best athlete, the, the best basketball, athletic basketball player that you can right now. And uh, – if he fits in the mix with other people mm-hmm. they have, then great. If not, you know, then we have a right. desirable player to trade to another team. What I like about Danny Ainge, too, is that he's not quick uh, to the trigger on that. He's really waiting for the right deal. Mm. Um, he's not mm-hmm. going to make a trade just to make a trade. He proved that this past um, right. um, last trade deadline this last right. season. Everyone so. was all hot about him getting Jimmy Butler, and he kind of yeah. put the brakes on that a little mm-hmm. bit. Because one thing that we haven't even talked about yet is that the Celtics have – pretty much the best young coach on the planet right now. I would agree. And pulling together the group of guys he had this year and to have the, the run of success that they did, mm-hmm. especially during that you know third quarter of the season, if you will, right. was remarkable. Yeah. Remarkable. And I attribute that to Brad Stevens. I do too. And I think the fact that he gets these guys to play together is a really big mm-hmm. thing. And then, quite honestly, we're a fun team to watch this year. You, you know, it was you went into every game thinking, yeah, they, even those Golden State Warrior games, they, they could do this. They could do this. You yeah. know? Well, they won one of them. And they yeah. won one of them. You know, <laughs> so I mean, so, the streak. You know, so I mean, yeah, they broke the home streak for the Golden yeah. State Warriors. So I mean, really, it's a tribute to his coaching. But mm-hmm. to me, where I see the benefit of Brad Stevens coaching is the fact that he gets these guys to play defense. It's mm-hmm. the hardest thing to do in coaching is to get people to play defense. And it's the hardest thing in the NBA to get anybody to play defense. And Brad Stevens gets him to do it. And, and to me, that's the best thing about that. So I agree. And I think he's very good at molding young talent into, into, what, mm-hmm. into what he wants it to be. So just that question, keep trade. What do you do with the third pick? Joe? Well, I mean, to me, you have to really kind of define what your goals are. <laughs> you know, um, what point um, in transition are they? Are they near the beginning? Are they still building? It's been a couple of years. Or are you in the middle of transition in which you need to make a move to start winning now? Mm-hmm. Um, like you stated, um, you know, last year they uh, they got swept by the Cleveland Cavaliers um, in, the fr- in the first round. This year they won a couple games. They're you know right. solid, and so they're, they're, it was a small improvement from last right. year. But um, you know, right now um, people might be losing their patience and kind of want to win right. now. So um, you brought up defense. Um, would you? I mean, I I don't know what I would do, but there's been talk that they might want to improve the defense, especially in the front court. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, I th- always think if you can get a top of the line front court player, you always do it. You always do it because um, I always like the big man, you know. But but I always think if you can get a top of the line front court player, so you know if Dragon is that guy, you know, then I think you keep the pick. How could he not be? I don't know. He breathes fire. <laughs> <laughs> he flies with tiny he wings. Flies with tiny wings. I never understood that. Like Pete's dragon. Uh, but Elliot, right? Elliot yes, is Elliot. Dragon. Yes, yes. Anyway, so if you can get coming that, soon to a theater near you. <laughs> if, if 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 Dragon Bender is that guy, then I think you go for it. You know, one of the other names that's been thrown out there is Bobby Heald from Oklahoma, who is a, is a shooting guard. Uh, but he's very similar to a lot of the guys they already have. Is he the best talent available? And maybe you do that you try, and you use him as trade bait for something else. Because but if they're in transition, I, I question who are they building around? Who yes. do they have on the mm-hmm. team right now that you can honestly say they're building around? Is it 
Isaiah Thomas? Is it Jay Crowder? I mean, there have been great players, and I mean, I think Isaiah Thomas can be an exceptional player, and he's showed streaks of that this year, but I still don't see him as a guy that you got to build a team around. I don't think so either. So who they're building the team around right now is Brad Stevens. Yeah. They're mm-hmm. building the team around this coaching philosophy. So would you yeah. trade someone like Isaiah Thomas for you nope. know, Kevin Durant or something like that? <laughs> I would not trade for Kevin Durant. Mm-hmm. Him. I, you, I, you, you, I would want to have a point guard of similar ability because Isaiah Thomas with Kevin Durant, Right, yeah. we got something there. Right. <laughs> Having said that, with the success that the uh, right. um, OKC is having right now, yeah, it's, it, they, they've been talking all year <laughs> about the possibility of Durant being mm-hmm. uh, lured here as a free agent. However, as you said, mm-hmm. you know OKC is doing really well. They might even go to the finals. If OKC yeah. goes to the finals, Durant is staying in OKC. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so that seems to be kind of a uh, a pipe dream. Mm-hmm. You know, my my thing is always, you know. That same kind of thing. Who are you building around? But also looking at the team, are they really one player away from winning a championship? Nope. If they're one player away from winning a championship, you well, draft that player that you need and you go for well, it, or you, you trade for him. But it depends on not, who the player is. Okay. You know, you could argue if they have LeBron James, then... Then they're one player away. You know, okay. so... So is Kevin Durant that but, player? And do you but, throw anything you could get to get to Durant if that happens? I wouldn't trade Isaiah Thomas for Kevin Durant straight up. Okay. But well, I don't I, think OKC have, would either, so... <laughs> true. But having said that, I think... Everyone's on the table. I, I would agree. I think. I think. I think it has to be the right trade. And as Joel said, Ainge is very good at making that yeah. right trade. Yeah. But I'd say ev- everyone. I agree. I don't think there's the anybody table. untradeable on this team. I, the I really only two do. people I really like on this team is Isaiah Thomas and Jay Crowder. If they can keep those two guys and get mm-hmm. a Kevin Durant, which is not going to happen because you absolutely right. have to get rid of either Isaiah. But or how many Kevin Durants are there? Who's <laughs> <laughs> the first Kevin Durant? <laughs> <laughs> Inside joke. Inside yeah, joke. But, but but then again, there are other free agents coming up that can fill the backcourt. Like right. like you got Al Horford and you got um, big guy Houston. <laughs> Help me out. Oh, oh, you mean uh, um, yeah, yeah, big, yeah. I, I, see, I, I wouldn't trade for him though. Right, right. I, right. I wouldn't sign you, Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard. Dwight thank Howard. you. Thank you very oh, much. I, mean, I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go for Dwight Howard. I don't think Dwight Howard would fit on this team. I really don't. But but would you would you sign? And that's me saying that. To, like the big doofy to lure huge guy. someone else. I mean, you're probably going to have to pay top money, so you probably wouldn't have the money left, even right. though Celtics do have a lot of room in, in cap space. Right. However, you know, you, you might not still have enough money to, to lure someone in if so you have you, one. So you mentioned Horford. Is, is, he's a possible trade bait that people have mentioned. We mentioned Jimmy Butler from Chicago. I personally would not trade the number three pick for Jimmy Butler. I don't think I would trade the number three pick for Al Horford either. No. I would be very tempted with Okafer. Uh, from Philadelphia. Okafer is only 20 years old. He's 6'11". He could be that big guy. Um, he averaged 17.5 points a game this year, seven rebounds. If he can give you 20 and 10 for 10 years and you keep Isaiah Thomas or something like that, and you know, Oka- he, he, I, but I don't see – but then you always have that thing what we talked about before is do you give – a team in your own division, the number one and number three. I don't know. But remember, what you, what are you getting for that? Well, that's exactly you it. You know, if you're getting a number three or number two pick type player. Right. Okafor was the number yeah. three pick last year, yeah. just for, for you know, argument's sake there. I think, you know, the, the advantage of trading for Okafor over going for Dragon, you know, he doesn't have as good a name. But beyond that, <laughs> um, you know, he's a proven NBA quantity. You don't know if the Dragon can play in the NBA. You know that Okafor can play in the NBA. We call him the Dragon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it starts here. <laughs> I'm, I, am, I am patenting that. If they get him, I am patenting that. The Dragon. The Dragon. Okay. His time is now. <laughs> His time is now. All right. So would you would you guys agree that front court is, is, the, is the biggest problem for the Celtics right now or the biggest issue that needs to be addressed? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it's been really the Celtics' problem in any of their – down years has sure. been the lack of a big man. You go back to the early 90s to the pre-Garnett Eric days. Montrose wasn't the man. <laughs> he was slightly better than A.C. Earl. <laughs> slightly. <laughs> Only slightly. <laughs> um, though A.C. Earl is a good name, though. A.C. Earl is a good name. Like no it. dragon, He's though. No dragon. He's no I, dragon. I, I just think a lot of championships are built on defense, and uh, mm-hmm. we are have the defense in the backcourt. You know, we have one of the best defenses in the backcourt, in my opinion. Um, and in a side note, I think that's one of the big reasons they faltered in the first round of the playoffs. When as soon as Avery Bradley went down, yeah, yep, I absolutely. mean, not that Avery yep. Bradley is the guy, but there is no the guy on this team right. except maybe slightly Isaiah Thomas. But as soon as he went down, he he has that defensive presence and he can score. And like, well, that the whole balance right. of the team right. is off. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's part of what Marcus Smart is missing. Also, Marcus Smart is missing that scoring element. He's an mm-hmm. excellent defensive player. If he could average. 
12 points a game, 15 points a game, I think you'd look at this team, you know, you're one, two, three in the backcourt and go, wow, that, that's, a, that, that's a great backcourt. But um, So I think someone like a Marcus Smart, I think Avery Bradley, I actually, as we said, I think everybody is tradable. Um, you guys are talking great basketball. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I do agree with you with, the, uh, with what they need, but I also th do think they need a superstar. I mean, you guys are talking basketball. I'm talking about the NBA. You need a superstar <laughs> to get some calls. I know you, you guys notice, are going to hate me saying There is a difference. There is, there a, is difference. a difference. <laughs> you know, you, you need that superstar to get the calls and, you know, to add. So who that. is that? I don't know yet. I Maybe mean, it's the Dragon. <laughs> 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 yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, you can't win a championship. Actually, you really need to have two, you know, superstar t quality players. I think Isaiah Thomas could be one, but you need another one in the NBA. Yeah. As a general rule of thumb, you need two. Isaiah would um, be a great two. Yeah. In my yeah. When did that start? That you needed two. I think the or Celtics and the Lakers in the 1980s started that. Yeah. I think. I mm -hmm. think you know. Well, in those days, you needed three Hall of Famers on a team to to win a championship. Um, good times. Good times. You know, <laughs> but I think it really started then. You needed those big. You know, the, those three superstars on your team. And if you look at the teams in the 80s that won, mm -hmm. you have you know the Lakers, the Celtics, the Sixers, and the Pistons. They all had those three or four guys who were just uh, otherworldly in comparison to everybody else. I'd argue that the Pistons didn't really. Pistons were more of a team. Yeah, but, but, I, but, but Isaiah Thomas is was is a Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah, Hi, Isaiah Thomas. Hall of Fame player. Joe Dumars. Different Isaiah Thomas. Yeah, it's not the same <laughs> one. By the way, is it still weird rooting for Isaiah Thomas? Yeah, oh, I, 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 I have it. a hard time doing I that. choke <laughs> on my words every single time. <laughs> well, the thing that saves Isaiah Thomas is he, right now the, the new Isaiah Thomas. He's right. one of the more likable players. He spells players. Isaiah right. Yeah. <laughs> for one thing. I will say he's one of the more likable players in, in, in the NBA yeah. right now, in my opinion. He's just... How can you not like this? And guy? it's hard not to shoot to, to root for the short guy. Yeah. <laughs> I, as much as I like the big doofy guys, it's hard not to root for the short guy. It always is. Okay. So, any other needs we think the Celtics need to address? Uh, they need Steph Curry. Okay. <laughs> Good All point. Right. Danny Ainge. Great analysis. There it is. Steph Curry. <laughs> you get secret. Steph Curry. Trade the team. We'll play with one guy next year. <laughs> and Brad Stevens, the coach, because he's a genius. He's an absolute genius. Give the ball to Steph. <laughs> My team is on the court. Coach is only Steph. My team is on the court. <laughs> but, okay. I had a game kind of like that a few years ago. Where I, anyway, um, one of the things that's come up in the last couple of weeks, it kind of came up last year too, but I think it's been a little more serious over the last five, six days, is whether or not the possibility of bringing Paul Pierce back for a final season in Boston. Uh, the argument in favor of that might be that Paul Pierce could lend some veteran presence to a team that's trying to do better. Uh, the negative is, of course, you know, been there, done that. Uh, John, what do you think? Paul Pierce comes back? Um, I would love to see it. I'm not sure if it uh, makes a ton of sense. You would have to sign him at you know, whatever the veteran minimum is. And, right. Um, it, it'll just be more of like, kind of like for nostalgia purposes, you want him to retire as a Celtic, I think, and everyone in Celtic Nation would want that. Sure. Um, and not the cheesy one-day yeah, contract. Yeah, one-day contract. No, no one cares about that. <laughs> <laughs> Although it's awesome when it happens. <laughs> but, I mean, I would love to see it, but, I mean, we, we, can't, we can't pay him. Yeah. You know, so. Um, yeah. But the thing is, I'm not even sure if he can command a lot of money anyway. So, right. yeah, bring right. him back. Two years ago, he had a phenomenal playoff run with the Clippers. Yes, I mean, he did. Not the Clippers. The, last, with, uh, last year. Yeah, was no, last, last year. It was, last he was year. on the Clippers, but two years ago, he was with the Wizards. Yes. He had a phenomenal playoff run. He won how many games, buzzer beaters? And um, with the Clippers this past year, when all the their stars went down, he had a huge opportunity to kind of revitalize his, you know, not career, but just, you know. Yeah. Revitalizes people, youth. Yeah, <laughs> convince people to sign him for another season. Although he's technically signed for next yeah, he year has, he has one for um, yeah. um, the Clippers. But you know, I just he had a huge opportunity, and I was kind of like, ah, you know what? I think he's done. <laughs> yeah, I think his uh, last playoff run with the Wizards was his last playoff you run. Know, yeah. Deep, you know, going deep to the well. Uh, sentimentally, yeah, I'd love to see him back again. You know, and retire as a Celtic. I don't think it's in the Celtics' best interest. Okay. It really is because they can still have the Paul Pierce night after he retires officially. They can mm -hmm. still get that you know, PR day done right. without signing him and without throwing off the balance of the team. I, re I really think he would. Okay. Yeah. Just like what they're doing with Wade Boggs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. 12 years later. 12 years later. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do a little sooner for Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, the Boston Celtics, as we mentioned before, have never had the number one pick in the draft, despite all of the Hall of Famers and all of the great players that they have drafted over the years. And so one of the questions that I had is, is what do you think the greatest number, or greatest first round pick that the Celtics have ever made has been? And it's kind of... In one ways, it's, it could be obvious and maybe not because, you know, arguably the best player that ever played the NBA was a, was a sort of pick for the Celtics. But anyway, I kind of wanted to go around and say, going all the way back in their history, best first-round pick ever uh, for the Boston Celtics. What do you think there, Joel? 
Best pick before dragon. <laughs> <laughs> the dragon. The dragon. <laughs> Sorry. The stuff that legends are made of. <laughs> the easy answer is Larry Bird. <clears throat> okay. For me. Easy answer. Um, you know, won three championships. We had to wait a year to get him, mm -hmm. but... Which is part of the story with Bird. Yeah. They had, the, the, in the 1978 draft, they had the number six and the number eight pick. They used the number six pick to draft Larry Bird, even though he already said he was going to go back for his senior season in Indiana State. And they just assumed they'd be able to sign him before the deadline. So it was kind of a, a chance that Red Auerbach took that actually paid off. Which you can't do anymore. No. <laughs> called the Larry Bird rule. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Yeah. No. Interesting. Yeah. So you think Larry Bird, best first-round pick of all time? For the Celtics. Yeah. For the Celtics. For the Celtics. Yes, Sorry, absolutely. for the Celtics. Okay. Eric, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say not Bird, and you know, without Bird, then you we probably aren't sitting here right now because we wouldn't have cared about sports in Boston in the 80s. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> it didn't happen. Well, and, 1986 you know, Red Sox, but... Yeah. We don't talk about 1986. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my bad, How my many bad. Times? I'm sorry, sorry. What, what happened in 1986? Uh, uh, how about the uh, 86 uh, Patriots? Oh, wait a minute. Wait no, a minute. no, no, no. 86 Celtics. We 86 Celtics. Like, we like you know, those without stuff. the Bird pick, you don't have all this other... The other. So I, I would agree with Joel that, that Bird is probably the biggest true first-round pick that they've ever mm -hmm. had. Um, I think the shrewdest first round was two years later in 1980. Right. When Red orchestrated, I don't know, he got three, four teams together and allowed him to get, like, two big, doofy Hall of Fame players <laughs> in Kevin McHill and, and Robert Parrish. Right. Robert Parrish not drafted Jeez. that year, but the trade from – the uh, right. number one pick, number two pick there, and then Mikhail at three. Right, right. I mean, this it's to me, to me, reading that story is, is and remembering, you know, those days. I mean, how do you pull that? You can't do that now, right? Or people are onto you now right. if you're trying that. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it was the strategy that Red, Red Auerbach <laughs> used <laughs> because he convinced everybody that he wanted Joe Barry Carroll. And, but and who, who was who was ended up being the number yeah. two pick, and he convinced Golden State Warriors that he would be willing to accept the third round pick, which was ended up being Mikhail, which is who we wanted anyway. <laughs> so he basically got the guy he wanted, and he would have drafted at number two anyway, and picked up Robert Parrish in the bargain for the for the pick. Yeah. I mean, it's just a phenomenal. There's your, game. There's your front court for the next. Decade, a yeah. you know, dozen years. Yeah, because they already had yeah. Bird, so they had Bird, McHale, and Parrish <laughs> for the next 10 years or whatever, however long yeah. it was after that point, a dozen years, really, yeah. the next 12 years after that. Yeah, to me, that's really the best one of all time, to me. just Certainly you, the shrewdest. Certainly the shrewdest because, mm -hmm. because of you get two Hall of Famers for one pick. That just doesn't happen anymore. Um, and so that's why I would pick that one, the 1980 draft, um, number, that particular draft pick, uh, because of that. Any additions to that? Um, those two picks are, you know, you can't argue with those two. I mean, they're pretty much my answer. However, I kind of went at it with um, a value at where you got them in the first round. Okay. And um, I just call it the miracle of 1998. Paul Pierce fell to number 10 and we snagged him. Yeah. Wait, could you say that with your best Rick Pitino voice? <laughs> 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 did, did he draft Pierce? <laughs> I forget. Did yes, he draft yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Last year we weren't lucky, you know. That whole oh yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Because in 1996 <laughs> we drafted Walter McCarty from the <laughs> University of Kentucky. So this time we had to make a better pick from Kansas, Paul Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Pierce came through that door. Is that Patino or Tom Sob? No, sure. <laughs> and now Boston's negativity doesn't stink. <laughs> <laughs> I think going with that, that theme, um, you know, kind of going with that theme with Paul Pierce at number 10, Jojo White with the number 9 pick in the first round, also in 1969, pretty darn good pick mm -hmm. at number 9. Um, Everyone uh, forgets about Jojo. I never do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you also had Al Jefferson at number 15, mm -hmm. who, if you remember, was the centerpiece. It wasn't the only one, but he was the centerpiece of the trade that got Kevin Garnett here. Um, and also, so, I mean, we never really saw really what he would have become, but Reggie Lewis at number 22. Yeah. From Northeastern. Oof, that's a great pick. Yeah. A yeah. great pick. Yeah. And unfortunately, that didn't. Out of nowhere, really, because yeah. he played in Northeastern. And, no and you, always, him. you always have to wonder, you know, the number one pick in 1986 was Len Bias, who had the unfortunate. So they did have the number one pick. Death. He, no, it wasn't the number one. He was their number one. Okay. He was their number one. You have to think about what a Boston Celtics team with Len Bias and Reggie Lewis would have been able to do with the aging Mikhail Parrish and Bird. Just imagine. It, it would have been. It would have been. I think it would have been a special team. You know, for for longer than it already was. Um, you also had. I know you had brought up Dave Cowens in 1970. Yeah, I mean, on the start of a downward trend because they didn't win the championship in 1970. <laughs> right. You know, Russell wasn't playing more. Heinsohn wasn't playing more. A lot of the old guard had retired. Havlicek right. was still playing, of course. And who's also had, a good pick? They had the number four yeah. pick, number seven pick in 1962. And uh, it was. 
you know, if you look at the 1970 draft class, it was it's a class riddled with Hall of Famers, right. and they got Dave Cowens number four and set up their success for the 70s yep. right there. So in one, really in one pick, and then Jojo White, yep. you know, the following year or 72. It was, it was the other way around. Oh, um, was, Jojo White was 69, okay, Cowens right. was 70. But so, yeah. you know, putting those two together. Along with still having you know, Havlicek. You know, there's your success of the 70s, yeah. and they won in 74 and 76. Right, and P- Pistol Pete Maravich. No. <laughs> 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 that was a little later on. Yes. Uh, just to kind of round out some of the great uh, first-round draft picks of the Boston Celtics, you had Sam Jones, who was picked number eight in 1957. Um, and then, of course, we didn't even mention the 1956 draft, and I know well, you have a lot to well, say about this. The draft was so much different then, too, because they had things called territorial picks. Yes. And I'm not quite sure exactly how it worked but the idea that teams were allowed to draft players who were playing schools in their in their in region their region right. and so Tommy Heinsohn was that territorial pick. right right and Red Auerbach in his you know first of his many shrewd trades yep. and whatever St. Louis Hawks trade uh, um, drafted Bill Russell number two and um, Red offered him Ed McCauley Easy, Ed yeah. McCauley. Ed McCauley, who was their primary scorer at the time yep. for Bill Russell. The Hawks said, no, we want this other guy, Cliff Hagen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. who had been in, in the Navy, I think, or some military yeah. service at the time for three years, hadn't never even played with the Celtics, and they're like, we know, we want Cliff Hagen. And Red's like, Red must have been thinking, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he played it off, and like, he argued for a little bit. Yeah, right. And he said, all right, fine, I'll give you Cliff Hagen also. <laughs> And then he lit up his cigar. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the second round, Casey Jones. Yes. Great. I mean, probably the best NBA draft day ever for a team. Three Hall of Famers ever. and arguably the best player in the NBA of all time. With you know, and that's, without that draft, would we have had the NBA as we know it today? I mean, I don't mean to be, like, dramatic like that, but really, you know, without Russell, Heinsohn. Heinsohn, who won Rookie of the Year that year yep. over Russell, if you recall. Yep. Yep. Not that we were there. No. <laughs> I remember it well. Wait, even you were alive? <laughs> I watched it on TV. Okay. Yeah. And and by the screen get, was this big. Going through all these names, it's, 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 just, it's just so amazing being a Celtics fan because you hear these names and just how they continue to serve the team. Yeah. Russell player, Russell becomes the coach. Tommy Heinsohn then becomes the coach, wins yep. championships. Casey Jones then becomes the coach, yep. wins championships. You know, we were talking 30 years of success. Also, Danny Ainge, who was selected you know, in the second round of, what, 82? 82, 82, right, yep. 83 or Also drafted right? by the Toronto Blue Jays. But just think yeah. that not only were all three of those players 1956 Hall of Fame players, they, they were, were all, all championship-winning coaches for that same team. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's a heck of a draft. Just to uh, round out our draft <laughs> talk here, uh, also one more draft we want to talk about. Just quickly, we have only a couple seconds left. 2007 draft, the Boston yes. Celtics drafted Jeff Green, which they turned around into... Ray Allen. Which brought... KG to the Celtics and gave us a championship. For so Al Jefferson from 04. Yes, that's right. So, <laughs> so and to uh, add to the drama of that draft, that's when they got shafted because they were hoping for the number one or that's two right, pick with that's right. Greg Oden. Yeah. Or Kevin Durant. Or Kevin Durant, right. Yeah, so but they, they probably would have picked Odin. Yeah, they probably would have picked Odin. <laughs> no matter what Danny says. <laughs> they would have picked Odin. They would have yeah. picked Odin. It would have been in Fab Mello a couple years would've earlier. Been a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Has Odin played a full season? Uh, no. Will he ever play again? No. Well, I think if you combine all the games together, it's a full season. <laughs> and they're pretty good numbers. Yeah. He also was the oldest looking 20 year old you've ever seen in your entire life. He had wrinkles at 20. All right. Well, we need to uh, wrap up here the first half of the big picture we've been talking Boston Celtics basketball and offseason stuff and who knows what the Celtics are going to do one thing you can be guaranteed of is that you never really do know what the Celtics are going to do by the way 2007 draft they drafted big baby too in the second round which is awesome <laughs> uh, so we are going to take a break here on the big picture and uh, have a few messages from a few of our friends out there in the world and we'll be back you're watching the big picture here on RC
Okay, we are back here on The Big Picture on RCTV. I continue to be Kevin Vent. This continues to be Jonathan Vent. Good evening. All right, this continues to be Joel Vent, and this is The Big Event, Eric Vent. How's everybody doing? Awesome. We uh, talked a lot of Boston Celtics basketball in the first half and uh, basically came to the conclusion we have absolutely no idea what the Celtics should do. <laughs> <laughs> it took us 28 minutes to figure that out. Uh, in the second half here, we're going to talk about the Boston Red Sox. Yes, your Boston Red Sox are finished just a game or two over the uh, one-quarter mark of the season, and they are 27-17, and 17, I think kind of a surprising 27-17. and 17. Uh, A fun team to watch. They are second in the AL East behind the hated Baltimore Orioles, who, you know, even though the Red Sox won like 20 in a row, are still behind them. I can't figure that out. Um, and John Farrell is still the manager. And John Farrell is still the manager. We <laughs> talked about that a couple shows ago, but whether or not he'd still be around. Uh, they're also happy to be second place overall in the, in the, in, in the AL, in, in the NFL. In the AL. The National Football <laughs> the League. The National Football League. <laughs> they do have more wins than any NFL team right now. <laughs> yes. I have to admit. <laughs> also more losses. Um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, uh, the second in the AL. So technically, if the playoffs were to start today, they'd be the wild card team. But that's stupid to talk about in May. Anyway, so I want to start off talking about some of the highs and lows. What has been kind of the highest point of this season thus far, and what has been the lowest point of that season? Maybe we'll start with you, Eric. What do you think is like the highest point of the season? Well, it, it's kind of hard not to say right now. I mean, okay. going into tonight's action, Jackie Bradley Jr. has a 27-game hitting streak. Yes, he does. This is a guy who wasn't supposed to be able to hit at the major league level. He wasn't supposed to be able to hit his weight. <laughs> you know? And that was the, always the big concern. They yep. knew he could run. He could do, he could play the outfield. He was you know the best outfielder in the system. Right. But he couldn't hit. He showed signs of it last year. Mm -hmm. He went on a nice. He streak. went on a tear in August you know, last year when it didn't all. mean anything. Right. Right. But now. He's hitting 27. And these aren't just like light hits. Right. I mean, he's up to eight home runs, nine yeah. home runs. He's now. squaring up the ball a lot of line you know, drives. He was the American League player of the week a week mm -hmm. or so ago. And he's had some huge, huge hits. And he's been batting all over the order now, no longer in the nine hole. I think right. he's batted mm -hmm. seventh on Sunday this past game. and But he's. He's bad third the, also. And, the Cleveland Indians intentionally yeah. walked him twice in the seven hole a couple games ago. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, so I, I can't remember the specific Shades of game. Bill Miller. <laughs> there was the one game, I believe he, oh, I could be wrong, he almost hit the cycle. Or am I confusing? I can't remember. You're talking about Ortiz? Ortiz. Well, that was Ortiz weekend. the yeah. other day, but Jackie, yeah, Bradley, Jackie Bradley earlier Bradley on the also, street. Yeah. He was a, he was a single know. off the cycle. Right. He had and two doubles, a triple, and a home yeah, run. I he think was a single off the cycle. You're right. I can point to that game right there as, as maybe the highlight of it all. Sure. But hopefully there's more to come and even bigger highlights. Yeah, another point with the Red Sox this year, right now, as we speak, as we go into game action tonight, I think they have 22 or 23 games in a row with a home run or something like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, um, franchise club record, record yeah. Yeah, franchise record. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? High point of the season thus far? Uh, definitely the bats. I'm going to agree with Eric here uh, with Jackie Bradley Jr. just coming out uh, really sort of out of nowhere, really. Um, and, but the thing is, I'm not even just going to point to him. I'm going to say the resurgence of Ortiz. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, it, it's hard to say he's resurging because <laughs> he's been awesome for so long now. <laughs> But I, mean, I yeah. never even thought he could be this good. <laughs> if only he played like this back in 2013. I know. In <laughs> I mean, if, if you think about it, it's just what a career. No one, no one saw this coming back when we got him in what was it, 2003. 2003. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then I the ne next few years, I mean, Joel, Joel was his first fan. I was about to say that. <laughs> but um, but everyone's saying, oh, is he going to be in the Hall of Fame? You know, which we'll probably get to later. Um, people were saying no. Every single analyst has said no. He's not going to keep it up. Right. He certainly kept it up, and he. If, he plays for another, another couple of years. I know this is his kind of a his farewell tour, but if he plays for another season, he has he has a shot at six hundred. Well, yes, he does. And he the really thing does. is, he started to negotiate through the media already. Yeah, yeah right. when he yeah. said, "Well, but it, it can't would help himself. It would hard to put twenty five million away. <laughs> <laughs> is he just opening negotiations right now? I, I <laughs> but uh, yo, I, I'd also like to you know talk about Xander Bogarts too. Mm -hmm. I mean, Very solid. I mean, he has he has like a 17 game right now at, like coming that. into yeah. tonight's yeah. action. He's hitting 320 or something like that. Uh, uh, even higher. I, 341. I he's, like oh, really? he's way yeah, up okay. there, and he, yeah. he he's been overshadowed a little bit uh, by by Jackie Bradley Jr. But I don't think we should forget him. And it's not just him. All the bats are alive. Virtually look, every single bat is alive. Like five guys in the lineup hitting over 300. Yeah. Mookie Betts in the last two weeks has raised his batting average by like 40 points. Mm -hmm. I mean that. Typical even, at the beginning of the season, but from 220s up, he's at the 262s. And, and even mm -hmm. the experiment at first base of Hanley Ramirez, not only is he keeping it up offensively, but he has looked fine at he's first base. He's found his position. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. This is uh, Mr. Steve Crook on the show a couple of episodes ago. Imagine you play an infielder in the infield, and he does okay. <laughs> um, it's hard to fathom that. Um, Joel, uh, high point of the season? Oh, I'm going to say the bats, too. <laughs> 
Justin Pedroia is your sixth best hitter on this team. <laughs> <laughs> Two ninety something. Yeah. I mean, you have three in the top five batting average. Right. Four in the top ten and five or six in the top twenty. Yep. In the league. In the league. Yeah. That's insane. And they're the top batting average in the league, team batting average in the league right yeah. now as well. Now, you know, it'll be. I mean, I don't think they're going to keep this up, but twenty five percent in the season. You know, that's still early, but it's still. The twenty-five percent mark. Yeah, that's a significant chunk of the season. It's a decent si- sample size, I think. Mm-hmm. You know, I think if it were the first two weeks of the season, you go, well, it's just the first two weeks, something like that. Like but, Brian Dawback is hitting six hundred. <laughs> <Yeah, right. laughs> He's the next Ted Williams. <laughs> I love Brian Dawback. We love Brian. Yeah, we love the Dauber. Yeah, like Dauber. the Abe Lincoln beard. <laughs> For me, the highest point I actually chose an actual moment. There you w- go. Was May fourteenth was the eleventh inning walk off. David Ortiz yeah. walk off hit was to, again. Granted, it was against the Houston Astros, which everyone thought were going to be better this year, and apparently everyone was wrong. But to me, that was kind of like, wow, that was a great moment. And 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 people, I don't know, forget. You know, he hit the double to win the game after Bogarts um, yeah. got on mm-hmm. base and stole second, I believe, or for a pass ball got on second or something like that. But uh, Ortiz hit the triple, a stand up triple to mm-hmm. tie the game in the ninth inning too. So I mean, to me, that was just like, this is a right. team that can come back at any moment and any time. Um, however, when you have highs, you also have lows. Joel, what do you think? Low point of the season thus far at the quarter waypoint. I'm going to be nice to Panda, and I won't state the obvious. I'll go with something else. Um, <laughs> the low for me was um, uh, David Price's rough start to the season. Okay. Um, that was a low for me because I, I'm generally pretty excited when we get that one ace that we think we need right. for a championship team. Um, his rough starts have been the low for me, but hmm. I'm on a high right now because his last couple starts were he has, pretty he, decent. He, he, so. He's been okay. He hasn't been that number one starter over the last couple starts, but yeah. he has begun to turn it around. Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, low point of the season thus far? Every single time Clay Buckold starts. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for a how guy, many times is he going to get beat by a three or four run homer? You know, three for a guy with such great play. stuff, supposedly, and he's routinely giving up. He's having those innings where he's giving up four or five runs, and he has like, already given up uh, nine home runs this year. You know, that puts so. him on pace for whatever nine times four is <laughs> <laughs> thirty-six, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, you know, it's not the one moment that I know you're looking for, but you know, every single time you, know, you used to get excited about Clay Buckholtz, yeah. You know, and especially when he was healthy, you know, and that, and. And supposedly he's healthy now. They, you know, so hopefully he can turn it around because we know we know what he can do, or at least what he has done. So if he can turn it around, I mean, I think that's going to help out this team Eventually. over the year if he can eat up innings. That's if the big he, thing. We need these pitchers to go their innings. I'm not so concerned about David Price's overall performance, you know, in some of those other games, but I do want him to go deep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I know there's your a connection is, there. Your but, A should go seven, you know, we, at least. We need these guys to eat up Ideally innings. eight. Yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> no, no, so that, young. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't you happen know. in the uh, Major League Baseball anymore. Um, yeah, I kind of agree. Clay, Clay Buckholz has been a real disappointment. <laughs> if Clay Buckholz can turn it around, you know, he's he is that number two guy that I think they kind of need. We're going to talk about that in a minute or two. Uh, low point of the season thus far. Uh, I'm not afraid to state the obvious. Okay, here we go. <laughs> it's actually before the season. <laughs> Spring training when uh, Kung Fu Panda showed up out of shape. I mean, I'm one to talk. But I'm just saying. <laughs> but, when, diet pills. When, <laughs> but you know, when you're paid millions of dollars and you show up, you know, you show up like that. They just, claim he showed up at 255, but I don't believe it. Yeah, yeah. Because David Ortiz is is like 235. Look David Ortiz is looking svelte. He is very svelte. He's, he's a fine looking man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just just like you know, when he just comes to spring training like that, um, you know, didn't put any effort really during the winter. I mean, I can't say that for sure. I wasn't there, but I'm saying he doesn't look like he put in a lot of effort to really keep his body in shape to uh, um, kind of come to a squad that's looking for, you know, to be at the next level. They just added Dave Price. It was like, hey, you know what? We, we're going to have some right. quality pitching coming into the team. And, um, you know, uh, we could use his – I mean, back then we said we could have used his bat. But, you know, <laughs> it, it turns out that we really don't need his bat right now. But you, you never know. Uh, yeah. It's a long season. It's a long season. Anything it's a long happen. season. Anything can happen. And we really – um, that, that's just kind of the low point for me when the start I was like oh man 
when what? is it when has it last happened in, in any sport but particularly in major league baseball that a guy you're paying 90 million dollars to gets beat out by a guy who's in his like eighth season in the minors for a position <laughs> on the team travis shaw i'm talking about who mm-hmm. won who beat out the kung fu panda for a position at third base on this team before we found out he was injured it's um, kind of blessing in disguise oh it's a great blessing in yeah. disguise i have no doubt i'm not you know yeah. i think that's exactly uh, it there so so uh, yeah i think the kung fu panda uh, a low point, possibly, but I think we may see it as potentially. If Shaw continues to play the way he has played, we may see it as actually a good thing. I actually did pick out a specific moment of the season too as a low point, and for me, it was Fenway Opening Day. Fenway Opening Day, all the all the team is coming back. David Price, because of the rainouts in Cleveland, was starting. Red Sox scored three quick runs, and in the third inning, Price gives up five runs, kind of what you were talking about. Um, the Red Sox battled back and were leading going into the ninth inning, and our new closer, Craig. Craig Prim- <laughs> Oh, Kimbrell gives up a home run to, to Chris Davis in the top of the ninth and loses the game, blows the save. Yep. And to me, you're just like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> it was a real low point for me. I'm, did, I'm sorry, did, did you get over it? <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I've been in, in counseling for a month and a half. You know. You need more. <laughs> Why did they do this to me? <laughs> <laughs> I need more. <laughs> but you must be satisfied the way Kimbrell's pitching right now. Yeah, I mean, I, they, they just yeah. clocked him out 100 yeah. over I mean, weekend. every every closer has that yeah. one or two or three, except for you know, Dennis Eckersley in 1989 or whatever it was. It has this one or two. Well, even in 1989 in the World Series, he gave, or 1988, excuse me, gave up the home run in the mm-hmm. World Series. So every closer has that moment where they, they blow it. And no, no closer is perfect. But I agree, Kimbrough has been, has been great um, for the most part thus far. Any other highs or lows this year? I mean, we've talked about you know pretty much every player on the team. Yeah. I haven't heard an update on Brock Holt. Right now, I know he's going he through a concussion, concussion yeah. issue. And, I mean, I think he's the type of player that kind of typifies what this team is all about right mm-hmm. now. Just scrappy guys who can play lots of different places uh, on the field, who can, you know, run well on the field, can hit, get clutch hits. Yep. You know, I mean, heck, we're having Blake Swihart and, and left Vasquez, field. you know, playing around and getting clutch hits, too, along, you yeah. know, we didn't mention yeah. them. and they're, Playing they're, left field, too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Swihart yeah, exactly. and left field. Yeah, we're going to talk you about know, that in a moment, too. You but know, so... I don't know. I, I hope he's okay, yeah. and I hope he's able to come back to the team and still be a. To me, the other thing, um, you know, you talk about uh, Christian Vasquez. Is I think there was a real jolt of energy into the team when he came back too. Also, you know, he had been out. Uh, he hurt himself. He actually was a catcher who had Tommy John surgery, which doesn't happen all that often, um, and came back in the second series or the third series of the season in Detroit in uh, Toronto. And I really felt felt the team got a real jolt of energy when he came back. Uh, so I thought that was really, you know, mm-hmm. really uh, good. And he and he's he's uh, to me is a terrific catcher. I mean, he's our Jason Veritek for the next ten or fifteen yeah. years. I think I think he's a terrific catcher. I agree that that was a great moment but it was no Doug, Doug Marabelli coming back <laughs> <laughs> no, police no police escort no police escort, escort. I, I swear he came down in a parachute <laughs> <laughs> with a machine gun <laughs> wiping out Yankees as he goes by <laughs> all right well I mean we, we, we've talked about how how in general how well this team has done but I do think if there is uh, anything we have to look at to be a little concerned about, there is the question of starting pitching. We mentioned Buck Colts. We mentioned Price. Um, fortunately, Rice, Porcello, uh, uh, Wright, Porcello, and uh, Joe Kelly have been pretty decent, um, all told. Wright flirted with – or excuse me, um, um, Kelly flirted with a no-hitter the other day. Um, the question I have is, is, do we think we need another starter on this team to really go for a World Series? I'm talking about going for a World Series here. Um, do we need that number two starter behind Price? Yeah, we got to do it for Poppy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One more. I mean, you can never have enough pitching. Mm-hmm. You know, look, really, the Yankees' success in the late 90s and the early part of this millennium um, was really centered on the fact that they would go into a season with like eight legit major <laughs> league starters. Right, right. You know, and one went down, it was next man up. Because you, know, you very kind of rarely thing. go through a season where all of your starters right. start exactly. every game. Exactly. So, 2004 Red Sox. All five starters started every single one of their starts. Other than that, I mean, someone gets injured. Right. At some point of the, right. every season. And what happened that year? Um, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, obviously, you know, starting pitching, starting pitching, if they can bring in someone else, that would be fabulous, you know, because hopefully Price has turned the corner and is going to be the guy that we thought he was. Hopefully Buckholtz can be the Buckholtz of, you know, three or four years ago. Um, not when he was hurt, but when he wasn't there. <laughs> um, but, yeah, always always pitching. And the thing we got to remember, we have Eduardo Rodriguez waiting in the wings. Yes. You know, and – Who was uh, very good at the end of last season. Yeah. Um, showed a lot of real promise, and hopefully he can continue that. Um, I think my fear is is that he's only pitched – 
those couple of mm -hmm. you know those 10 starts or whatever at the end of last season and that maybe we're putting a little too much hope into a guy who we really don't know what he is um, I do think they need to try to get another starter as you said you can never have too much pitching yeah. um, I think part of the reason we talked about Swihart one part of the reason they're kind of showcasing Swihart in left field is for trade bait uh, you know they've got Vasquez as the catcher of the future you don't want your backup catcher to be a young guy you usually want him to be the grizzled Doug Marabelli veteran oh, kind of guy no. and Hannigan <laughs> is a fine is a fine role in that mm -hmm. so I think they're showcasing Swihart as as major league talent to get major league talent back, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, he can run down those fly balls with his with his hat flying off, you know. <laughs> yeah, and he, he actually caught a wall ball. He caught a wall ball the other day, as well. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, I even saw him bear hand one off the green monster perfectly to hold a guy to a single over the weekend. Yeah, too, so yeah. I mean, so so certainly has all around talent. Um, that's that's definitely traded. And I think they're showcasing his athleticism. That's what they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, and saying, hey, this guy could play left field, but he's also a catcher. Don't forget, you know, <laughs> he's the first catcher I ever saw legitimately steal a base. By the way, last season, I don't know if you remember that. He, you know, he took his secondary lead and took off, and it was just like, you know, it was a real stolen base, not, not a, one of those delay steals that Veritek used to do. Yeah, yeah, not the, the Jason Veritek delay steal, you know, kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, any ideas about a pitcher out there that the Red Sox might try to target in a trade? Any thoughts? I think they should go after Surzer. <laughs> 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 Sorry, guys. Had I had to do it. I think Henry Owens <laughs> and uh, minor league uh, outfielder, and I think maybe we we we, we could get Kershaw. <laughs> Dude, that would be sick. That would no. be sick. Sure's you're all the way. He had 20 <laughs> jumping strikeouts. <laughs> that would be 20. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so putting the talk radio talk aside, you know, the stupid trade. Well, you got to look. Legitimate we gotta look let's, look. let's scan the field. Are there teams that are underperforming now that right. are looking to sell? Or have absolutely that, no chance. Exactly. That, that are looking to sell, that have still decent pitchers, but they don't have the offense to back them up. And mm -hmm. so who's coming at the end of a – of a, a contract, you know, so they want to get something from right. him. You know, that's right. that's the kind of guy we got to be right. looking for. So who's out there? Well, one of the guys that I targeted, of course, he just went on the DL and hasn't been that good this season. Is Sonny Gray from Oakland? Mm -hmm. um, he's uh, at least through last year and the, the very beginning of this year is, is kind of their ace. He's in the last year or the second last year of his deal. There's no way Oakland is going to resign him because they never resign those mm -hmm. guys, and they're not going anywhere. Of course, he's also on the DL, and who knows what's wrong with him, and he hasn't pitched that great over the last month and a half. So, But that might mean that they Because he was injured. Because he was injured, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's possible that the Red Sox, if they could get him, might get him for actually less than he's actually worth because mm -hmm. of, you know. And maybe Oakland is one of those teams. I know, you know, I don't know the specific names off the top of my head, but I know the Sox have some highly rated prospects in their system and in the infield. And if you think about the infield, we have Travis Shaw, we have Bogarts, we have Pedroia. There's no place for those infielders to go. So they should be legitimate trade bait mm -hmm. um, for, for, for someone else, especially if you package a major leaguer like a Swihart with them. Um, so, so you're saying if you get a trade with Blake Swihart, <laughs> Maybe in minor Liga, and maybe Walter <laughs> Makati. <laughs> he might I don't be able to get Sonny Gray. You never poss I, I, I actually do think it's possible because of the injury to, to Sonny Gray this year. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the way the offense is, is gelling at this moment, it would be hard to you know trade one of those those guys that are actually performing and actually making the team succeed. Right. So it's 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 good that you're bringing up you know their prospects and, and maybe you know one other guy that's not. Right. You know, one of our main... Yeah, because, I mean, they're not going to trade Mookie Betts. They're not going to trade right. Jackie mm -hmm. Bradley Jr. They're not going to trade Travis Shaw. They're not going to trade Xander Bogarts. You know, so, I mean, you got to look at the minor leagues. But, you know, to get major league talent, you always got to trade major league talent. That's a general rule. And, and mm -hmm. I think that's why Swy Hunter's there. They're proving that he's major league talent um, and that he is someone who can um, play in the majors. And, and he actually is playing a pretty decent... Yeah. Left field, you yeah. know, we'll see. Another one that I thought of was uh, uh, Julio Teheran from Atlanta Braves, who's, who's pitching lights out this year, but Atlanta's not going anywhere. It's true, yeah. And, and uh, you know, they might be someone, you know, kind of like the Danny Ainge thing, wanting to stockpile a bunch of talent, you know. Yeah, well, the Braves would be the perfect team to kind of pillage because, you know, they've let go of their manager. Right. They're, they're they basically have, They've already sold they've off the season, the season, basically. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, let's, you know. Pick them apart for parts. Yeah, you know? yeah, and <laughs> yeah, so right. I think I think it's a possibility. You know, I, um, um, Chris Archer from Tampa Bay has been brought up, but trading inside the division, it always comes. You don't back. like that. I, it always comes back to bite you. It always we traded Bledsoe to Buffalo. It worked out pretty well for the. <laughs> 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 that's true. That's true. That's true. We traded trade Bledsoe to, to Buffalo. Even so, I don't like trading the division. The other thing with with Chris Archer with Tampa Bay is he, he is two years ago he signed a long extension, so he's under their control for several years, and they might not want to to part with him. I don't know. Yeah. 
Uh, also, another thing that needs to be said is like ours is our surprise pitchers, like you know the Steve Stephen Wright and uh, mm -hmm. Porcello. Porcello. Um, well, it's hard to say he's a surprise. Well, I mean, no, Porcello's Por Por been okay, but but Steve Wright, I mean, he's he's thirty one years yeah, old. Yeah, yeah, he's and he's, he's coming a in and uh, he's he's uh, he's brought the knuckleball back to the Red Sox. Yes. Yeah, you know, and uh, or, you know, or Ryan Hannigan is going to lead the league in uh, pass balls this year. <laughs> so 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 what Get do you think? Belly. <laughs> so 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 you think those two people can? Can you know keep it going for this season? Yeah. And I, I mean, and I, if they can keep it going, you know, I have high hopes for Joe Kelly too. I think he is, you know, when he hasn't been injured this this year and last year, he's actually pitched pretty well for us. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm th I'm looking at that. Price is your number one. Then you mm -hmm. have like Kelly Porcello three, Kelly Porcello four, right five. Who's that number two? Buck Holtz. <laughs> <laughs> we can only hope. We can only hope. Anything else on the pitching? I, I, the other thing that concerns me a little bit is is uh, the amount of usage the bullpen has mm -hmm. that they've had to use. You know, last year um, Tavares, not Tavares. Last year, uh, um, Julian Tavares. <laughs> Julian Tavares. I, I see Joe and John, and I think Julian yeah. Tavares. Oh man, that, that was a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> we'll no, Tazawa. I'm thinking Tazawa. Yeah, Tazawa fell off at the end of the season, got injured because they overused him the first part yeah. of the season. And guess who's getting overused again in the beginning part of the season? It's it's um, same thing. So so I'm a little concerned about that and it seems to me that you really only have those couple guys in the bullpen that can do anything and, and so I'm a little worried about that step to the bullpen. How it is across the league pretty much. It is. It Ask is. any team or any fan of any team. What do you think they need? Middle relief. <laughs> you, know, you know why you need, need middle relief? Because they're the worst Because pitchers. your starters aren't <laughs> right. going, going five as innings. far as they need yeah. to. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I always need middle relief but middle relief are always the players that you, you hope right. that you don't have to use. Middle relievers so are if, always those guys who weren't quite good enough to be starters <laughs> and quite yeah. not quite good enough not to be closers. Good. <laughs> enough to be later on. You know, so when they had the lead, you know, their bullpen is set up nicely. I mean, you got Koji, you got Tazawa, um, uh, Tazawa in there, and um, Kimbrell. Kimbrell. So that's good, but it is those those games when they need some guy to come in in the fifth. Yeah. Yeah, to me, to me, I mean, you you're know. seven, eight, and nine, you know, as we said, works out great, but you can't use them every single night. Mm -hmm. Now, fortunately, you know, as we know, Koji obviously can close for you also. So, I mean, you can, you know, switch those around if Kimberl needs a night off, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's, it's that nights, those nights you can't use them or we don't want to overuse those guys. Koji got injured last year too, if you remember, because mm -hmm. of overuse as well. So, so we just want to be careful. If we want to make a deep playoff or a World Series run this year, we're going to need those guys. And so, but to get there, we're going to need someone else to fill in some of those innings. So I'm a little worried about that. Um, anything else? Sox need a left fielder. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, one of the things that we've seen this ha happening this year, obviously, I, I don't know if I call it the resurgence of David Ortiz. <laughs> yeah, sorry um, about that. Yes, there was, was one season where he only had 20 home runs, right? 23. Yeah, 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 he, he was all done yeah. then. Yeah, he was all there done. Was one full he actually has never had a full season with the Red Sox. He's only had one full season with the Red Sox where he hit under 30 home runs. He had 29 one year. The other two seasons where he had 23, he only had part seasons. He only yeah, had 90 right. games in one and 123 in the other. Wow. Um, so, I mean, it's pretty impressive. He's he basically had like been, 80 RBI. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's, still, he's been a 30 home run guy, but it's basically every year. Um, so, you know, if you had asked me two years ago, which we probably did, talk about on this show at some point is David Ortiz a Hall of Famer I would have said eh, I'm not so sure with a season plus uh, on the track now I know how Eric feels about this uh, but Joel what do you think David Ortiz is he a Hall of Famer 1000% yes okay why the significance of his hits okay and the fact that he's the face of a franchise that won the World Series the first time in 86 years. Right. And two um, other times in his. And two other times, yeah. yeah. You can't forget about those two years, but absolutely. I mean, he's had a phenomenal career. You talk about the clutch hits. Um, David Ortiz this season has come up 16 times with a batter on second or third with two outs in the inning, and he has eight hits and, you know, like 12 RBIs or something like that. I mean, it's just like talk about timely hitting, clutch hitting. That's really who David Ortiz is. What do you think, yeah. John? I, I, I'm, I'm not going to be a naysayer, you know, so I'm, I'm going to say David Ortiz absolutely should be in the Hall of Fame when everything is said and done. Uh, people are going to throw the DH card at him, uh, certainly. Right. Um, but, you know, when you look at it, you know, He's been the best DH for the last, you know, 12 or so years. Um, Seven-time Edgar Martinez Award winner, which is the prize for the best. Which they, uh, by, by the way, they're probably going to rename the award. The David Ortiz <laughs> Award, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just just like you know, timely hitting, you know, face of the franchise for three World Series, really. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't really argue with that. All right, Eric, David Ortiz, Hall of Famer. Honestly, I think the biggest fact in his favor for his Hall of Fame credentials—it's not really part of his credentials, but in the continuum of Hall of Fame selectees—is Jim Rice. Hmm. If Jim Rice is in the Hall of Fame, which he is, and I believe Jim Rice belongs in the Hall of Fame. 
David Ortiz has to be in the Hall of Fame because he's done it better and for longer at the plate than Jim Rice did. Right. I feel the same way, only I changed the name from Jim Rice mm -hmm. to Tony Perez. Tony Perez played first base on the big red machine mm -hmm. reds of the 1970s, and he wasn't the face of the team the way Ortiz was. Mm -hmm. uh, Ortiz's numbers are better, more consistent, and, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. There was no, Tony Perez also did play and for the for Red longer. Sox. And for longer. Tony Perez did yeah. play for the Red Sox in the, uh, for a couple of years in the 1980s, full disclosure. <laughs> uh, but to me, if Tony Perez that is in the Hall Tony of Fame, <laughs> which, he, which he is, how could David Ortiz not be in the Hall of Fame? Right. Uh, just a few stats I'm, on... Uh, can you think of any other number four, number three hitter that was the central part of the offense for three World Series winning teams. You probably can come up with some you know, right. Yankees players and right. things like that. But, but, the spread but then apart. spread out yeah. over 10 years. And you always have to condition that with in the age of free agency. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mickey Mantle played on a lot of great Yankees teams, okay, and, and has that, you know, uh, ba Babe Ruth, you know, mm -hmm. et cetera, you know. But, you know, in the age of free agency, they, they, you just don't keep players like right. that, number one. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and number two, the teams change around so much more that it's hard to keep that, that winning thing going for, for that long a period of time. Yeah. And all the naysayers they say, as we said earlier, he wasn't supposed to be still doing it now. Right. He wasn't supposed to. He was done four years four ago. Four years ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you could argue he's had – Last season was one of his best seasons mm -hmm. hitting, and he's on pace to have an even better season. If you take year. OPS into consideration, actually mm -hmm. last season was his best season in OPS. He had a 1.39 something or other yeah. uh, OPS last year, and that was one of the best. A couple of stats to finish up on David Ortiz here, actually. Um, is, uh, he's a nine-time All-Star, uh, six-time Silver Slugger winner, uh, top five in MVP voting five times in his career. As I said, a seven-time Edgar Martinez Award winner. Um, in the World Series, his OPS is 1.392. Mm -hmm. OPS, by the way, is uh, on-base percentage plus slugging percentage put together. Um, it's considered an offensive stat for not just um, – getting on base but also for power um all time 22nd as we speak tonight 22nd mm -hmm. in home runs 27th in rbis 30th in at bats per home run or home runs per at bat i should say uh 15th in intentional walks <laughs> all time uh, <laughs> it's more of a comment on the rest of the team <laughs> than it is, but I'll take it. he is 13th in doubles uh one of only three players with 500 home runs and 600 doubles in, in, in major league history full disclosure albert Pujols is only about 15 home runs or 15 doubles away from doing that also so, so he'll probably get there as well. But I don't mind sharing the spotlight with Albert Pujols. <laughs> he's okay. He is, yeah, he's a pretty decent player. So what my, my opinion is, uh, David Ortiz, um, if you had asked me even a year ago, I would have said, eh, he's kind of on the fence. But now I think if he continues through the rest of the season, has his typical 30 home run, 100 RBI season, um, and the Red Sox do very well, he is pretty much a slam dunk Hall of Famer as far as I'm concerned, which is, is different from where I came even from a year ago. And again, even just, just, look, just the moments themselves, all yep. the clutch hits, the where? series winning hits, game winning, everything. Yep. Absolutely amazing. And it's his city. Yeah, it's his city. It's okay. our city. It's our city. It's, it's, his, our... it's his flipping city. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, <laughs> we will be done. Well, I thank you for watching The Big Picture tonight here on RCTV. My guests have been uh, Joel Vent, Eric Vent, Jonathan Vent. My name is Kevin Vent. I am the host of The Big Picture. We uh, look forward to seeing you next time. Take care and have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>